be a alim if you don't practice what you learned. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr inna l-insana lafi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat So surely by time man is at a loss. We are all at a loss in time. إلا الذين آمنوا except those who believe and do good deeds. Do you see it says believe and do good deeds, not believe or do good deeds. You're gonna understand when you reading the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is very specific with His words. When you believe and do good deeds, this is knowledge. What you learn, you implement. Don't try and take the knowledge. And I mean, teach it to others, but don't do it while you haven't been trying to implement it yourself. You don't have to master it, but teach others when you are trying to implement it. You are on a journey to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Your knowledge could be a sin for you, a proof against you, or a proof for you on your Qiyamah. Why? If you learn all this knowledge first and foremost, and you don't practice it. Our deen is not a deen of showing off and scholarship that oh I need to be the biggest YouTube mufti or the biggest Twitter alim. It doesn't work like that. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala won't look at how many followers you got and give you rewards based on that. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will reward you based on your actions. That's why He says, "Allahi khalaq al maut wa al hayat li abluqum ayyukum ahsan wa amala." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created life and death to test you which of you will be the best in deeds, not even the most in deeds, the best in deeds. So if you want to be a good Muslim, you've got to be a good human being. And so therefore, when we talk about learning and practice on that learning, that is what we need to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's written in the hadith, Anyway, in the Sahih Hadith, authentic Hadith, that your learning can be a proof against you or a proof for you. What does that mean? If you learn something and you didn't practice it, that knowledge will destroy you. If you learn something and you practice it, that knowledge will make you. See, it's not about being a know-it-all in our deen; it's about being a do-it-all. There's a difference, right? Why? And that's why Islam stands out in today's time because it's preserved better than most religions anyway. But more than that, it emphasizes actions. You know, in other traditions, you go do what you want and then sing a couple of Hail Marys and then you're done. Here, we focus on what's inside. What is my connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What am I going to wake up and do today to make the world a better place, to make myself a better place? How am I going to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? Is it making sense? Yeah. So another thing we have here at Medina, which is beautiful, you get to question your teachers with respect, which means if you don't understand something, ask. If you feel you may have heard something different, with respect, ask, and say, I heard this. Now, one of the things we do with adab. Who knows what adab means here? Anyone know? Adab? What does it mean? Manners, etiquette. It means how to behave with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. How to behave with His creation. We have etiquettes in Islam, and so therefore, when you ask your teachers, ask your teachers politely, without a tone of authority, but you are free to challenge and debate. That's why we are here to learn. We are here to express our opinions and learn why they may be correct or incorrect. And we are here to respect difference of opinion as well. So I encourage you to ask me questions. Stems to talk about beneficial knowledge, right? 
because I mean there's not beneficial knowledge. I mean if you learn uh, I don't know how to go clubbing, I hope you don't practice on that. You, That would be more, so let me put it this way, your Islamic knowledge that you get, your knowledge about Islam, Quran and Sunnah, you should be practicing. If you learn the skill and you don't use it like diving, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold you accountable for that. Because that's part of what you want to do as a human being, that's part of what's legally permissible for you. So if you do it or you don't do it, there's no reward or punishment. But if you do it with a good intention, maybe you learn to dive because you want to help environmental issues to save the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from dying, you get rewarded. Anything you learn can be put to use in al-Islam. Any special skills you have. This is the beauty of our deen. From the time you wake up till the time you sleep, you can be in ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a good question. Anything you learn can be used for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But generally, we need to learn and practice Quran and Sunnah. Right? And it's very easy. It's not hard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made certain things found upon you. Only very few things. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't drink. You know, don't commit zina. Do your salah, zakah, siyam, hajj. Whatever you do extra, as Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar said, is only better for you. That's it. Whatever you do extra, how am I going to come closer to my Lord today? Right? And by studying, you are coming closer to your Lord should you implement that, should you have the correct intentions. So what should be my intention when I come here to study at Medina? Anyone wants to try? Because everything boils down to your intention, right? What should my intention be? There are people that go to Islamic uh, institutes to destroy Islam. They come to learn it so that they can take it apart in the inner workings. Is that a good intention? No. So what should be my intention? Anyone wants to try? I can say no wrong answers. Alhamdulillah, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop you already. Alhamdulillah, 100%. Seek knowledge for the sake of Allah. Are you seeking knowledge to impress your parents? Are you seeking knowledge to be the next Umar Sulaiman? Are you seeking knowledge to be the next Facebook Mufti? Or are you here for Allah? If you are here for Allah, congratulations, you are on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if not, just recheck your intention. Everything and anything you do for Allah. I love you, mommy, for the sake of Allah. I love you, my brother, for the sake of Allah. I learn for the sake of Allah. Because when you make him the center of everything, he will never disappoint you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything you see here will disappear eventually, isn't it so? Everything. Allah says that everything will perish except Allah. He will never disappoint you. When I am not here, when your shuyukh are not here, when your parents are not here, Allah will still be here. Allah is always here and near. When there's no one to hear you, He hears you. When there's no one to watch over you, He watches over you. When there's no one to listen to your du'as and to your sorrows, Allah is there for you. He does not hate you. He loves you. He does not despise you. He wants you to succeed. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are His creation. Any of you today, uh, ladies, when you bake a cake, it's technically your invention, isn't it so? You like it, right? It's your hard-earned effort and work. Even if it flops, you still want to try and chow it because like, it's your invention, you know? Guys, your invention, when you score the best goal or you know, when you, <laughs> when you win a race, you put your hard-earned effort into it, isn't it? Huh? 
It's your thing. Why do we, when, when soccer teams are playing, why do we say we won? You feel a sense of belonging. Why me? <laughs> so, when you have something that you feel connected to, you love it. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything, including you. And He favored you above everyone else, as the Qur'an says. Al-Qur'an al-Kareem says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have given the children of Adam karam, honor. Therefore, He has favored you above all. You are His beloved creation. Am I making sense, guys? Any questions? Anything? Again, the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. That's all I'm going to tell you. You are encouraged to ask. You are encouraged to question. You are encouraged to learn. So, here, we don't just go on our worms, right? We don't go according to this mufti, that, that mufti said, or this great imam said. We go according to Quran and Sunnah as well. So, if you want to make a case, for example, and you guys will learn this. I'm not saying it's hard and fast rules. Your teachers will go according to how you want to learn or, or your pace and your teachers will help you. But anything you say, let's try from now on to back it up with Quran and authentic Sunnah. And again, Quran and authentic Sunnah, not weak Sunnah. Right? So if you have something to say or if you have heard a hadith or if you've heard something, then think. You, you're more than welcome to ask your teachers. Your, your teachers will give you their method of working with them as well. They also encourage questions, I know, alhamdulillah. But for me personally, you can ask and we'll work through it together. Right? But we want to be a deen that's based on evidence, Quran and authentic sunnah. And why is that important? Because anything a human says can be mistaken. They can be differences of opinion. That's why people fight all the time. Isn't it? They say, my sheikh said this. Then this one says, my sheikh said that. Meanwhile, they're not even qualified to be talking about these things. Let the sheikh speak about them. They have more respect anyway. But if we say the Quran says this and the Sunnah says this. Now what are we doing? We are going back to divine sources. To sources that come that are not eligible to be mistaken. Al-Quran does not make mistakes. Al-Quran is above perfection. It is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now it's indisputable fact. Do you see what I'm saying? If we go to the hadith, then we have the words of the most perfect of creation, Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is important. And so that brings me to another thing. As students of knowledge, it would be fit you and it would be the correct adab, the correct etiquette. Every time you hear his name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least say subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jalla Jalalu, something. Because now you are a student of knowledge. Praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is meant to be praised. Every time you hear Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam's name, Whatever you want to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Ali, Allahumma Salli Ala Sayyidina Muhammad. But start getting a love for it. You know, start enjoying it. When you greet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ali, when you say Allahumma Salli Ala Sayyidina Muhammad, any of you know what happens? Hmm? One hundred percent. And okay, never mind. It's your first day. <laughs> the hadith says that. That's right. I was gonna ask you if you know the hadith that says that. But the hadith says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, there's two hadith that every time you say Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad or any form of greeting or salawat upon Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala ali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns the soul of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala ali so that he greets you back. 
and that every time you say or you greet him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi that he receives that greeting now what's so significant when I greet you I'm saying assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh what am I saying in English in plain terms yes may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you so what is that what am I saying besides greeting what am I doing for you making dua right may Allah's peace and blessings be upon you when we are sending salutations upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what are we saying? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Oh Allah, send your choicest blessings and peace upon Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, upon our master. We are making dua for him. But why does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi need dua? It's not that. It's that you need his dua. Because when you say, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah, May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you, Rasulullah. What happens in the hadith that we mentioned? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi greets you back. Now one of the hallmarks of a prophet is what? When they make dua, what happens? It's always accepted, isn't it so? So now imagine, you have direct connection. You don't need to go through anything. What, what do you do? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. What happens? He greets you back. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imagine the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single time you greet him, he greets you back. Every single time you are greeting him, he is sending greetings back to you. And he is saying, may peace and blessings be upon you. And what does that mean? That means that that dua is always answered. And that's why salawat, the ulama say that salawat is the only dhikr. The only words that you will say that will be accepted always, forever, in any state, no matter where you are, no matter how you are. Instantly be accepted. Not because of us, because of the most beautiful of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now that should give you incentive every time to say sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. At least. At least. Shaykh. You want to say some words or? Maybe I can say something two minutes. <laughs> By the looks of it, we may need more than two minutes, but Bismillah. لمن كان له قلب أو القصر أبوه وشهيد سلك الله العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا جزيلا to سيدي مواز كلا we have a very good introduction to Imam Al Bukhari and the purpose of knowledge and also admonishing us on selling salawat to our beloved Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The ayah I cited is from Surah Qaf. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرَ لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٌ أَوْ الْقَسَمْ وَهُوَ الشَّهِيدٌ Yes, you are all at Medina. Insha'Allah, some of you want to be here for a year. You may change your mind. You would want to go on further. Others have signed on for three years. We say, Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah. I just want to share an ayah. This ayah is recited from Surah Qaf. You will remember that sometimes you may have, you will learn more outside. Of course, what your teachers or what responsible shuyukhs and imams than what you would learn in class. And this is what happened to me as a student at Medina University. I had a tafsir teacher, may Allah grant him Jannah, but he happened to have been one of the great proponents of the Salafi school. And he was my tafsir teacher in the fourth year. And one day I was standing outside hiking, skipping. As you all, please don't try it here because we keep an eye on you. Decided not to attend the last period. 
and I'm waiting to hike from the gates of Medina University to the Haram al Nabawi, to the Prophet Sallallahu Mosque. And here the Sheikh comes, but his guy sees me standing. Yalla, udkhul. Jumping, sitting at the back. Two other students, one in the front, they're from different faculties. One in the front, one next to me. And the Sheikh said, you know, let us not waste time. And that is the first thing I learned from him. Don't waste time. From here to the Nabawi Mosque, let's benefit from one another and from each other. So he said, okay, he's not asking us, don't you have a last period? No. What did you learn in the, in the previous period? I Means our the period before we decided to leave. Let's just share, you know. And the student in the front then told the sheikh it was this period and this I learned, and then the sheikh added on to that. And then the one next to me said it was Hadith period, no, no, he had, I think it was another period. And he said, okay, the Sheikh added, and I'm sitting chuk. Title. And then he said, well, ante ya, ya akh, mother dressed of Hissat al madiyah What did you learn? So I said, wallahi, Sheikh, it was, I know it was Hadith period, that I know. But I was busy writing, you are fortunate, you live in a different era. We had to send letters, it takes about two weeks to reach home and then wait for another two weeks or three weeks for it to come back. I was busy writing a letter, but I just know it was Hadith period. You know, I was writing letters to my family. So then he quoted this ayah. And the meaning of this ayah is, you are all here as students, but you have to qualify and meet up with the three conditions in order to gain, to, to maximize your benefit. And this is, I think Sheikh is coming. Uh, okay, we will continue when I see you in class. Yeah, we give it to Sheikh. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم Go ahead, have a seat. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وصلى الله على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So who has been here? Who is this? Is their first year? Maria, raise your hand. Who is BA1, BA2, BA3? Okay. Type. بالإسناد المتصل إلى الإمام أبي عبد الله البخاري رحمه الله تعالى محمد بن إسماعيل البخاري رحمه الله تعالى قال باب فضل العلم وقول الله تعالى يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات والله بما تعملون خبير وقوله عز وجل رب زدني علما so this is the chapter of Fadlul Ilm or the virtue of knowledge. And that Allah Azza wa Jal says, which means, Allah raises those of you who attain faith and those who have knowledge, raises them on different levels. Obviously, you know, those who know are not equal to those who do not know, right? قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah says, which means are those who know, are they equal to those who don't know? Can that be the same? No. 
But I don't want you to think Ya'lamun, sorry, this is too loud, huh? Ya'lamun, I don't want you to think it's amassing data or the ability to regurgitate, memorize information. That's not ilm, that's ma'lumat. Ma'lumat means information. Ilm means hal, realization. Is that good, Sheikh? So I would like you the first, the, the first thing to take from this is to respect yourself and your deen more than reducing it to memorized information because that becomes hypocrisy if you separate orthodoxy from orthopraxy and no I'm not impressed. I don't care how much you memorize. And that's why the standard used to say, Al Hal Lisanu al Hali Afsahu Mil Lisani al Makal. Yani, the tongue of your state, of actual state, is much more eloquent than your actual tongue. Let your state speak. The state of that knowledge. You've learned? All right. How is that reflecting upon you? Is that making you a better human being? Vis-a-vis -vis the creator and vis-a-vis -vis the creation? Or is it running your tongue always with information without a reality to it? Information may not raise you, nor elevate you. In fact, it might be a trap that you fall in. It might be a false sense of security that you think you have. Hal or the knowledge that becomes a realization, a practice, a practice, a faith, a practice, and a life, that's a beneficial knowledge. That's why the Prophet ﷺ differentiated between beneficial knowledge and non-beneficial knowledge. Not every knowledge is beneficial. And I'm not just talking from a secular perspective here, I'm talking also from a faith perspective. And non-beneficial knowledge is a knowledge that you don't actually practice. You learn it to show off or to pass a test or so that people can call you, mashallah, he's, she's very knowledgeable, so impressive. Okay, so keep that in mind. And when, as you're studying here at Medina, obviously, you know, I like to call it Medina. I don't like to call it Medina Institute. I call it Medina. And if I hear anyone saying MI, I will personally persecute you. Because MI in medicine stands for myocardial infarction. And you will actually have one if you keep saying that. Yeah, and myocardial infarction means heart attack. So say the things that the Prophet ﷺ said. Medina was on the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. We're honored to repeat that name. Simple. Brings me pleasure that I can I identify with my Prophet ﷺ even on one thing. I mean, you know, I'm going to Medina, I'm coming back from Medina, you know, I'm studying at Medina. Right? I'm just saying. Uh, don't do abbreviations with me. I don't like abbreviations. And anyone who puts Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as S-A-W, there will be lots of S-A-C, S-A-W to C for them. 
That's disrespectful as well. So please, as you're studying here at Medina, try to take a lesson, no matter how small it is, from that knowledge. And by knowledge, I mean only the Quran and Sunnah. Everything else is not knowledge. <laughs> okay? Your articulation is not knowledge. Your presentation is not knowledge. Whatever you're doing is not knowledge. Their knowledge is what Allah said and what Rasulullah sallallahu said. That's knowledge. So get from that, glean, glean from that something that helps your state, that feeds your hal, not that helps you regurgitate. And that's very important. Because my idea behind Medina was, how do we make better people? Not how do I make scholars. Why? I can't make you a scholar. Simple as that. I mean, I can try, but I can't make you a scholar. Ilm in Allah comes only from Allah. No one can give that ilm to anyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ If you have taqwa of Allah, Allah will teach you. You have no taqwa, Allah will not teach you. Do you understand? I cannot teach you to be scholars in, in, in Allah Azza wa Jal, about Allah Azza wa Jal, on Allah Azza wa Jal. You never will be. I don't care how much you memorize. You will never be. Even if you eat the books. The only way you will be knowledgeable in this deen is if Allah allows you. And the only way you will be is if you have taqwa of Allah. And taqwa is not measured by humans scrupulousness, righteousness, piety, conscientiousness of the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, all these things. Sa'asrifu an ayati ladina. And Allah tells us another verse, I shall drive away from my verses those who are arrogant. Do you know them by their fruits? Like the Bible allegedly says? Yeah, of course you do. For those who see. And for those who are blind, nothing makes a difference anyway. باب من سئل علما وهو مشتغل في حديثه فأتم الحديث ثم أجاب السائل Chapter of whoever is asked about knowledge while he is busy in some conversation so he finished talking then answered the questioner طبعا الحديث has آداب وهاز etiquette وهاز all these things وهاز directions وهاز also it gives you a preview on the, on the prophetic sunnah ala sahibiha wa alihi afdalu salati wa azka salam I am saying that to you at the beginning because you're embarking on a journey of knowledge and I really don't want to waste your time and I don't want you to waste your time correct your intentions make sure that you're not coming here just so you can gain knowledge Make sure you're not gaining knowledge so that people say you are knowledgeable. Make sure you're not gaining knowledge so that you stand out. Because you never will actually gain any true knowledge. You'll be a parrot of information. No knowledge. And for those who read well, not impressed. You can't bring anything new. 
Allah does not give you tawfiq or facilitation, you will not impress those who know or those who are well read to say the least. So that's why I'm re emphasizing that. Al Isnad al Muttasal ila al Imam Muhammad ibn Ismail rahimahullah qala haddathana Muhammad ibn Sinan ibn Sinan qala haddathana Fulayh ha wa haddathani Ibrahim ibn al Munzir qala haddathana Muhammad ibn Fulayh qala haddathani Abi qala haddathani Hilal ibn Ali an Ata ibn Yasar an Abi Hurairah qala baynama an Nabi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa alihi wa sallam fi majlisin yuhaddithu al qawma ja'ahu a'rabi فقال متى الساعة فمضى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يحدث فقال بعض القوم سمع ما قال فكره ما قال وقال بعضهم بل لم يسمع حتى إذا قضى حديثه يعني صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قال أين السائل أو أين أراه السائل عن الساعة قال ها أنا يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال فإذا ضيعت الأمانة فانتظر الساعة قال كيف إضاعتها قال إذا وسد الأمر إلى غير أهله فانتظر الساعة So the translation here as they put it for me While the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم was saying something in a gathering a Bedouin came. Bedouin is yani someone who lives in a desert, right? So people who live in the desert are two kinds. Those who live in communities and those who live just with their sub-tribe somewhere out, out, not in a sort of, in a community uh, city, even if it's small. So those, the Arabs who lived outside of cities in the desert are called Bedouins, right? So a Bedouin came to the, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam and asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam, when would the hour take place? Mata saa When would the hour take place, Ya Rasulullah? Yani when would the day of judgment take place? When will a qiyamah happen? And I don't know what was in the mind of that Sahabi or that Bedouin. Yani. Maybe in his mind was the Prophet ﷺ would give him a specific date. Year so and so, month so and so, day and so. When it, so that means, as we're thinking, the hour may happen. A good thing for us to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Continued his talk That he was talking before So this man came and asked a question And Bedouins oftentimes Have that Yani people are talking They come and They just talk Right Yani that, that's why they say They're a bit Rough natured Right Yani not and Maybe not I shouldn't say rough Non-refined Nomads, nomadic uh, Bedouin Arabs living in the desert. There are no rules. The desert has no rules. It's just vastness and open. <laughs> it's open. It's free. Huh? And therefore, the, the, uh, the Arabs were used to being what? Free and being in the desert. No one tells you what to do. And you make the rules because there's no community really. You are the rule. You are the law. So they come a bit sometimes unrefined to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wants to teach them adab, etiquette. Adab yani what? What is adab? Huh? How would you translate adab? Somebody want to translate for me? Yes, sir. Etiquette. I gave that answer. Give me another one. What's adab? Yes. Manners. Okay, that's good. Yes. What else? Good conduct. Also good. Yeah. What else? 
what how we would say how would we say adab yes sir respect yeah that's good that's also good yes character thank you nice see additions are coming out more how would you say adab all that yes ma'am morals ethics humility simplicity lack of arrogance let me say so also so we understand what do i mean by humility You keep saying it. arrogance, arrogance, arrogance. I'm saying that for a reason. Allah rejects you and your arrogance if you're arrogant. Sa'asrifu an ayati. Allah tells you clearly. So I, I, that doesn't mean that you become a mat for everybody to step on. But it means that you conduct yourself prophetically as much as you can. All right? So, and that means an observation of your creator. So refinement is more important to me than ilm. Meaning, would you rather deal with someone who is knowledgeable but arrogant? Let me say, rephrase that. Would you rather deal with someone who has information memorized but arrogant or someone who has very little knowledge yet humble? To whom does your heart open? It's no question, is it? There's no question. The other one makes you sick. Literally. Huh? There is a riwayah that's not authentic to Ibn Abbas. That when he, when some students, obviously he's an imam in his time. Ibn Abbas is an imam in his time. When some students sit in his circle and he sees their arrogance, allegedly he would raise his hand to dua to Allah and say, رَبَّنَا كْشَفْ عَنَّا الْعَذَابِ إِنَّا مُؤْمِنُونَ Ya Allah, I'll take away azab, punishment from us. We believe in you. Because it's, it's torture. It's torture of the self. You're tort miskeen, you're torturing yourself and you torture others with that. Knowledge or information to become knowledge, it makes you a better person. I call it sometimes strive to, for simplicity. Strive. Actually, you have to strive for it. Because our nafs calls us exactly for the opposite. And we need to strive for simplicity. A Bedouin came and asked in the middle, usually what's the etiquette? Somebody is talking, you wait for them to finish their talk. Then you talk. Especially if it's the Prophet Wasallam. Why? Well, you honor those of honor. Right? You honor those of honor. What's the best honor that you do after, that you have after Iman? Tell me. Those who serve others. Not those who want to be served, those who serve, selflessly serve, those you honor. If you're honorable, you'll honor them. If you're honorable, you will honor those who serve. If you are honorable, you will honor those who selflessly serve. Again. That's very important. 
But if you don't know, the Prophet ﷺ teaches, right? I mean, the Sahabi is learning because this is their culture in the desert. Out. So he's learning and that's all right. Sometimes different cultures stipulate different things. Maybe he's a big man in his tribe in the desert. So a big man everybody listens to. Well, you know, maybe you, you learn then when it comes to knowledge. Uh, we all are learning. Nobody's big. What's the first thing in knowledge? When you learn, what do you learn? You learn how much you don't know. You know, in the beginning of, I'm saying that, it takes, it takes some time and some maturation, I understand. But in the beginning of knowledge, or the journey to knowledge, you think you pretty much knew it all. I'll tell you, I'll share with you a personal story, Annie. maybe 25 years ago or so. Yeah, Annie, when I was around 25. I had already been studying things, so I figured, all right, in Ulum al-Qur'an, I know I've studied about 50 books roughly in different things. In Ulum al-Aqidah, probably around that. Studied, not read. And I've no, I probably knew most of the major known books in the field. If I didn't study them, I've heard of them. You can throw any name I've heard, and I could probably give you a synopsis even if I didn't read it, read about it. The same thing in Ulum Sunnah, right? Let's say the, the Riwayah, some of the Diraya, maybe read about 50 at least books, let's say. Same thing in Ulum Al-Aqa'id, and then Fiqh as well, obviously. The Madhabi and the Usul, yani, Hanafi Shafi Al-Maliki and the Usul. And I knew probably, like I said, probably every major book in, the, in every do, of those main four fields. So what did I think? Hey man, I know. Throw me anywhere, in any subject, I know. And I thought I knew. And after 25 years, Whenever I visit my Sheikh, Allah grant him long life and health and, and Jannah, I realize how ignorant I am in all those sciences and how arrogant I was to think that I know or now that I know. And I sit on the floor if I can. I'm not trying to give you a modest story about myself. Allah is my witness, it's the truth. Don't ever let your mind play games on you or fool you. <laughs> In addition to the other, I say, man, I, I can't. Take someone who loses little adab, and here I have almost no adab with the sheikh, and he still accepts. I'm just saying. So when you learn, let yourself appreciate your own ignorance. So it keeps you in perspective. Every single one of you, every single one of you, that's sitting in front of me right now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it keeps falling and all this. Can you take this, man. This is all new technology of yours. Take it. I want, you put all that and this, as if we're sitting in a coffee shop. There you have that. Every single one of you, no matter how young and inexperienced you are right now, every single one of you has something to teach me.
every single one of you knows something I don't know. I don't know. I don't care how young you are. And I reckon that there's something that every one of you knows that I do not know. So I'm not here really to tell you that I am the master of knowledge. I'm here to tell you that I may have studied for a few decades something <coughs> that I will share with you. And it's not that I know it. It's the words of the teachers, of the teachers, of the teachers, of the teachers, to the great teacher of all. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, yeah, no, it's not my product. Nor am I that special super duper uh, person that I just came up with this. No. I'm just honored that I have been exposed to that and I ask Allah Azza wa to help me remain appreciative and conscious of His endowments and grace upon me. Because the only reason I was able to learn some is His grace. And therefore, adab is more important than information. Knowledge comes with adab. Information, not necessarily. Information makes people arrogant. The more information they get, the more arrogant they become. If that information is not actually ilm, which is knowledge and realization. Information will not transform you. Realization will. That's what ma'rifah or ilm is. All right? And that's why most of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the vast majority of them were not scholars. Yeah? How many scholars were among the Sahaba that are known? Yani Ahl al-Fatwa bayna al-Sahaba. How many? Who knows? How many Sahabas do we have in general? Yani according to the average count? Who knows? How many prophetic companions are there? Mom, you know, that's just a ballpark, ballpark figure. You should know that. How many? Huh? Throw numbers. It's okay. If you don't know, say, I don't know, but let me guess. Go ahead. How many prophetic companions do we have? Huh? Guessing 36. 36 of them or 3,600 or 36,000 or 36 million? Just 36. Allahu Akbar. Yes, sir. In the back. Were you trying to raise your hand? Yes. Sheikh, wasn't it on the order of 100,000? 100,000. No Google, huh? No Maulana Google business. All right. 100,000. We went from 36 to 100,000. That's a considerable leap. All right, who says more or less? Come on. How many Sahaba do we have? How many prophetic companions? Go, go. Yes, sir, in the back. Huh? 75? 70,000? Yes, Sheikh Fadda. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the academic figures, let's say, now, right, range from 60,000 to 140,000, right? There were no sense, senses that those days, so it's estimation how many people were in the final pilgrimage, and then add to that the tribes and etc. It's just estimation. So the least conservative probably, I mean like Ibn Hibban, 60, and maybe 140. And maybe some people like number 114 for whatever reason. So let's just say 114,000 just to take an average thing. 114,000 people, because the whole nation was prophetic companions, right? Everybody was a companion in a sense. Anyone who saw the Prophet ﷺ was a companion in our understanding. Okay, very nice. How many of those 114 were scholars? 114,000 were scholars? How many people were people of fatwa, yani? Fatwa meaning knowledge, not mufti, right? Yani of ilm. 
How many would you say out of 114,000? Anybody knows? Anybody has an idea? Yes. Yeah, no more than 10. Six, seven, eight, depending. Al Baghdadi mentions seven, Al Dahabi mentions, etc. So it's not knowledge in the sense of amassing information and becoming scholars beyond the basic needs is what makes you a better person. It's the adab and the akhlaq what makes you a good person. All you need is very basic knowledge you can learn over two days. That's good enough for the rest of your life in Islam. But your akhlaq and your adab is what makes you a good person. The vast majority of the Sahaba, they were all good. And they were not scholars. Are we on the same page there? So sometimes you see the ahadith and you see hey, that's a bit maybe abrasive, you know, coming and asking like this. But the Prophet is also amongst his jobs is to teach adab, teach, ed educate, and that refine. Um, so this uh, Bedouin came and asked the Prophet وسلم, when would the hour be take place? Allah's Messenger وسلم, and when you always as students of knowledge whenever you hear the name of the Prophet وسلم, you make salah and salam on him right now you're aware you're not just like any let's say unlearned people you now are aware it's not to compare you to unlearned because those unlearned people may be better than you and me together but it's just that your awareness should make you understand that when i hear the name of the prophet i say sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that's adab and knowledge, both. All right. But if you're given a choice between adab and knowledge, what would you take? Absolutely adab. No question about it. No question. Adab. The other one is adab. It's torture. Wallah adab. Torture, torture. Torture. Somebody who has information and thinks it's knowledge because and they're obviously they're arrogant that's the cert, the first the main sign of it is torture ya rab tayyib that's why allah azza wa jal tells the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam what wakhfid ha wakhfid janahaka lil mu'minin Lower your wings to the believers. Right? That's not humility. I don't believe the Prophet ﷺ is attributed with humility. It's not a prophetic attribute. For us, yes. Not for him. ﷺ lowers his wings. Right? There is no da'a fihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he needs tawadu. But he lowers his wings to the believers. We need to have tawadu. We need to have humility. <laughs> That's another attribute. That's another question. Right? <clears throat> so the, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to talk. They continued his talk after the man asked. So some of the people said that Allah's Messenger had heard the question but did not like what the Bedouin had asked. All right, for the various reasons we mentioned, let's say. And also, sometimes is, is not about the question. Is how you ask a question. When you ask a question, They used to say, 
السؤال نص نصف العلم right just asking the question asking questions is constitutes half of the of knowledge the difference between those who know and those who don't know oftentimes is not studying the same material is actually being what inquisitive asking questions far and beyond the scope we all study the same book let's say but the difference between those who are above average and those who are average are basically the ability not to just have access to the text. Everybody has a text. Not the ability to read the text. We all read the text many times. Is the ability, if Allah blessed you with an ability to ask questions to the right people and you get answers from them as well. That's more important than the base. This becomes the base, which everyone is equal to. The real distinguisher is what? Asking right questions and getting the right answers as well. So, السؤال نصف العلم وأدب السؤال النصف الآخر. So, asking questions is half of knowledge and the etiquette of asking the question reflects the other half of knowledge. So sometimes people, you know, you're in the middle of things and someone has a side issue he wants to talk to you about. Dhuq, etiquette, adab, right? Sometimes you're talking about something important and the question comes about the silliest thing possible. You say, but there's no question that's silly. Correct. Relatively speaking, I'm saying, if something is extremely important and you come and you want to talk about other things now, فهم, understanding, فقه ذلك بأنهم قوم لا يفقهون. Al-Quran Al-Karim says about the kuffar, the reason they lost, it's not that they're not equipped. The basic fahim is not there. These people don't. ذلك بأنه قوم لا يفقهون. There's no, there's nothing here. So, is asking questions is half of knowledge, and that's why you should never. There's no question that's silly or unimportant. But choose when and how to ask the question. That's the idea. The idea is not to prohibit you from asking, be careful. Ask. But what? How and when? I know you think you're the center of the universe. And you may very well be in your own world. But Allah showed us in the Quran that the universe has few more things other than just you. So Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam is speaking. The Bedouin comes and tells him, "When is the day of judgment? When is it going to happen?" And Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam continued his talk. It's not ignoring as much as educating. All right. So some people said that the Prophet ﷺ had heard the question but did not like what the Bedouin had said. Some of them said that Allah's Messenger ﷺ had not heard the question entirely. When the Prophet ﷺ finished his, finished his speech, he said, Where is the questioner who inquired about the Day of Judgment, about the hour? The Bedouin said, here I am, Ya Rasulullah. Then the Prophet ﷺ told him, إِذَا ضُيِّعَتِ الْأَمَانَةُ فَانْتَظِرِ السَّاعَةِ So here the translation says, when honesty is lost, 
I want to add amana rather than honesty. Amana is, honesty is part of amana. You probably want to translate amana, some people translate amana as trust, right? And trust should include honesty in it. But honesty and trust, our trustworthiness may have variation. So I would say, إِذَا ضُيِّعَتِ amana when honesty, trustworthiness is lost. What is amana? All right. The basic concept of amana is I give you this pen. I, what's your name? Aisha. Aisha. Oh, that's a tough name. Allah make you that. Oh, that's a tough name. You know, ishq is different than love. If you say ishq, may Allah take make you that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because no human being is worth it. Except Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? <laughs> Allah. So I give, what's your name, Shaykh? Abdullah. I give Abdullah. It's easier. I can deal with that. Because the ishq is way higher than my pay grade. I'm still trying to figure out love. So, ishq is. Right? When things intermingle with each other, when fabric intermingles with each other, that's ishq. See when you have threads intermingling to the point, not intermingling next to each other. All right. For those who, I hope none of you does, for those who smoke, what happens to the smoke with the, with the, with the clothes that you're, that you're wearing, that those people who smoke wear, it actually becomes part of the fabric. It's no longer separable. There's no separate entity anymore. That's ishq. So, let's talk about love is better than talking about ishq anyway. Well, that's a ghazali term. It's not a Quranic term. I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying. Tamam. That's why Quran speaks about mahabba and hub, love, rather than ishq. Right? because of the obvious technicalities involved here. So if I give Abdullah the pen, I say, keep this pen with you. I come after 10 years, he gives me the pen and says, here's the pen you gave me 10 years ago. I kept it, it's amana. But the pen is already done. That's, can't use it. It's true, but you told me to keep it and give it to you later. Here it is intact the way you gave it to me. That's amana. No. Abdullah was sit, sat in a majlis, happened to sit in a majlis, whether was invited or uninvited. And I was talking about something to someone. He happened to be there. Whatever he hears is amana. Now, amana comes here in the meaning of confidentiality rather than trust or honesty. If he goes out of this session and tells other people what he heard, he just breached his amana. That becomes khiana of the majlis. Are we there? No. You're a teacher. You teach them the deen. You start telling them about your own greatness rather than the greatness of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You have lost your amana. So you're a ruler, a governor. That you don't govern in, in decent ways. You don't have amana. So notice, amana means lots of things. No, no. Your very deen is amana in every one of you. 
Your children, your parents are amana. Your neighbors are amana. Society is an amana. Not cheating work is amana. Not cheating at school is amana. Studying at school when your parents send you to study is amana. And not studying is exactly betrayal of the amana. But your whole deen as a system is amana. The Quran Sunnah is amana in every neck of yours. Allah made it amana. So the Quran Sunnah is amana. It's a trust that Allah put with every single person. Fadal. Here you go, take. Carry the amana. So I don't want to translate the word amana as the translation here that says honesty. It's way beyond honesty. Some of the aspects I just mentioned to you here. So, and Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam told the man or asked, "Where is the questioner who inquired about the timing of the hour, or the hour?" The Bedouin said, "Here I am, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then said, "When the amana is lost." then wait for the hour. When, when you give people trust, they're no longer, when you put them in places of trust, they're no longer trustworthy. They don't carry it with amana. When you give people an actual material amana and say keep it, they don't keep it. When you place them in positions of responsibility and they don't uphold it right. When uh, uh, the Quran and Sunnah no longer are treated as amana, when ethics are no longer observed so people cheat, lie and steal whenever they can, not observing that, that's when the amana is lost. And when that happens, then you shall just wait. Now it's a matter of waiting when the hour will happen. And you don't want the hour to happen on you May Allah not make it happen because in the hadith we have indications that the, find the day of judgment happens on the worst of people. When khair, when goodness is almost, almost no longer present. So that's why the more you participate in positive contribution, meaning by positive selfless, the more you may actually in effect, if yani, that is to be said in a way, if it's applicable to say, you delay that time from your time. The more you're injecting in the system goodness, selflessness, guidance, the more you're reviving that system, even if it's dying, but it's still living. And once people lose that will, to selflessly contribute back and it will start it will start receding and reducing and eventually the day of judgment will be called that's why if you remember al hadith yani hasan fi babihi inshallah that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says uh, if the Qiyamah is called, now remember, Qiyamah is only called on the most evil of times, most evil of people, right? The total, there's goodness is almost no longer there, almost. There's always going to be some. But when Qiyamah happens, there's no more good, there's no more life now. The life has squeezed all the life out of you. Your heart is a rubber, stone, not living. So Qiyamah happens on the worst of people, in the worst of times, most difficult in the sense of there's no more selflessness. Khair is not much. Okay, so this hadith tells us what? If the sa'a happens to be called in your time, 
وَبِيَدِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَسِيلَةً And one of you has a, a small baby palm tree. Fasila is a small baby palm tree, right? Ba palm tree becomes really big. We have palm trees at the Medina Belgravia campus. But I wish they were date-bearing palm trees. You know, oh, it would have been very nice. You know? And we can send some people like Abdullah bin Mas'ud to climb on the palm tree and bring us some dates, you know, or Salman Farsi or somebody. <laughs> you know. Anyway. But better palm trees than, no, than other trees. It gives me the sense of Medina. I go and I see a palm tree, I say, SubhanAllah. It reminds me with Medina. I'm originally a desert boy, so it's okay. I don't mind the desert. I like it. Desert is freedom. There is nothing. There is heavens and there is desert. Right? Maybe sometime we should make a, an attempt to take everybody to the desert for a few days. No water, no electricity, and yes, no smartphones. I mean, or dumb phones, whichever you like to call them. Nothing. No blankets even. Yeah. Stand on the sand. The sand is soft sometimes. Huh? You'll have neighbors crawling by next to you. It's okay. So long you don't harm them, mostly they won't harm you. It's a good experience for a few days. Inshallah. Right? Food, scarce. Water, more scarce. Yeah? Maybe that makes us more thankful then for the abundance we have. Maybe that makes you squander less and appreciate more and share more. Because over there you have to share. There are these things, huh? people send them. I think we've sent a batch of students from, uh, so from the University of Georgia to the desert in Morocco, southern, southern Morocco. So. You know? Anyway. So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, when the amana is lost, then wait for the hour. One, meaning what now? Akhlaq is lost. Right? When the akhlaq is lost. When trustworthiness is lost. When faithfulness is lost. When truthfulness is lost. All these are amana. When the Qur'an and Sunnah are marginalized. When the prophetic figure is replaced by other figures. Then you shall await. Then you shall await the hour. The Bedouin said, How will that be lost? How will Amana be lost? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا وُسِّدَ الْأَمْرُ لِغَيْرِ أَهْلِهِ The translation said, when the power or authority comes in the hands of unfit person, then wait for the hour. What I will, the way I would translate it is, when the wrong person are in the wrong place, you just want to be in that place because you want, not you belong. You just want, yourself wants, you don't belong. Then you shall await the hour. 
الحديث في باب العلم باب فضل العلم في صحيح الإمام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى We'll take a 10 minute break here Inshallah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa alhamdulillahi wa rabbil alam Ya Rabb Maulana Muhammad, how are you feeling? Wallahi, if you put some of that, I would appreciate it. Alhamdulillah. Mitigate the liabilities, meaning, look, Abdullah, where are you going? He wants to stretch his legs. The man is thinner, thinner than a stick. The people of the land, and I mean now, not South Africa collectively, but also collectively. But the people of this land, the Koza people, the other people who are ancient tribes of this land, have a haqq and a right over us. And I think we have forfeited our amana with them, to be honest with you. But us not connecting them to the prophetic message even if they act like the Bedouin. They don't know. Teach them. But if we keep neglecting them, especially all of us, including me, but especially you, and come to the comfort zone here, then you are also betraying your amana. Meaning, I'm saying, come to the comfort zone, charge, go back to the work. The Prophet ﷺ used to go to the cave, charge, come back to the city, when he was only by himself. So, I don't care how rough, but okay, choose. Okay, there's rough, rougher, roughest. Choose. But Sheikh, Sheikh, we have to reach out to, to, the, to the local people, the owners of this land. And we have to bring some of them aboard and let them be the owners of this deen. It's their deen. The beauty of Islam, there's no hierarchy. The one who knows more is the leader. And we can teach them more, they'll be our leaders. I'm not happy. That's a dream of mine. It doesn't make me happy to see someone of them becomes a, a leader of the whole ummah. It, it's a dream. And you have, um, in the most difficult terrains, you have gems. Those gems will surprise you. In the most hopeless of places, you will have the light of hope. You just have to look for it. So work. That's it. Stretch your legs. So how are you?
Okay. I'm getting old. It's okay. <laughs> so my hearing is not the best. I have a question that's um, separate from It would be possible. Ay Rahman Ar Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwajihi wa dhriyatihi wa man wala. We're on the third chapter. Babu man rafa'a sawtahu bil ilmi. The chapter, chapter of whoever raises his voice in conveying knowledge. بالإسناد المتصل للإمام محمد بن إسماعيل البخاري رحمه الله قال حدثنا أبو النعمان عارم بن الفضل قال حدثنا أبو عوانة عن أبي بشر عن يوسف بن ماهك عن عبد الله بن عمر قال تخلف عنا النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وآله وسلم في سفرة سافرناها فأدركنا فأدركنا وقد أرهقتنا الصلاة ونحن نتوضأ فجعلنا نمسح على أرجلنا فنادى بأعلى صوته صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ويل للأعقاب من النار مرتين أو ثلاثة. The translation here on the authority of Abdullah bin Amr. He said once that Prophet Sallallahu remained behind us in a journey. He joined us while we were performing ablution for the prayer, which was overdue, right? We just, we were just passing wet hands over our feet and not washing them properly. So the Prophet ﷺ addressed us in a loud voice and said, twice or thrice, save your heels from fire or from the fire. This here obviously Bukhari rahimullah puts it under the chapter of raising voice and conveying knowledge because it's important. Right? So people hear but the hadith has also multiple benefits and all that, right? So, uh, when doing part that's connected to the hadith before it, right? The hadith before it was what? About the amana, right? Al amana. We mentioned that your studies as a student is amana, your time is amana. What do you mean, time? The time. Time that Allah gave you, your life, that's amana. Make sure you treat it right, amana. All right? Um, your, uh, we said your, your, the whole deen is amana. You being a child in a family, your family is amana. You being a parent to, to, to uh, kids, your kids are amana in your neck, etc., uh, etc., et right? So you being a ruler, that's amana. You being it's a judge, that's amana. Amana is a very wide concept. All right. Among the amana is what? That if you do something, you do it good. The hadith da'if, lakin the meaning is there. Inna Allah yuhibu idha amila ahadukum amalan an yutqina. Allegedly, the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah loves if one of you does something, that you do it well. Oh, Allah puts it in the Qur'an, right? قُلْ يَعْمَلُوا وَقُلْ يَعْمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Do something. Do. Not talk. Do. Allah will see what you have done. So it means do well. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal tells Dawood alayhi salatu wa salam in the Quran, I'malu ala Dawood shukra. O family of Dawood, do good deeds as a form of gratefulness to Allah. 
So it has to be on that level, right? So here the Sahaba radiallahu anhum as Abdullah bin, bin Amr is saying that, you know, we're hastening in our wudu real quick. And even in the salah, there's, there's no lion that's chasing you. So take it easy a little bit. I'm not saying you have to spend an hour if, that, if you don't want to, but take it easy a little bit. Say it so that you live it, Al-Fatiha specifically. And then also when it comes to the wudu, he says, we were just wiping wet hands, passing wet ha hands over the feet. And you're supposed to wash your feet. Wash your feet. And all that comes into the sense of amana. The amana is to do a good job, not to do a haphazard job. That's amana. You can do it, let someone else do it. You don't have the time, you have the willingness, but you don't have the capacity. Okay, great, then let someone else do it. That's amana. Right? Uh, this is not something that you know. So, a part of the amana here is also raising your voice and knowledge, which means what here? Being able to convey to everyone. Conveyance to everyone, that's amana, because it's amana for them to know, it's amana for them to carry. And it's a manna for them if you do something, <coughs> you do it right. Yani, you as students, you'll have exams coming up. And I hope the exams gradually get harder. Because that's just the right thing. I have lots of people complaining in life. Sheikh, the tests are becoming tougher in life in general, not just in an in in institutional system. And I always wonder, I mean, you always want to take a first grade test even when you're in fifth grade? Is that how life is? I mean, fifth grade test has to be a little bit harder than the first grade test and the second grade test. If the tests are not getting a little bit harder, it means you're not really growing. And when they get harder, it means you already passed the first test. Congratulations, now you're second grade. So past this one, you might go to third. If you pass the third, you'll go to the fourth. And take it as a rule. Nothing is impossible if you approach it with Allah. The easiest is impossible if you approach it by yourself. Nothing is impossible if you approach it with Allah. You want to study? Be conscious of your creator, of your create, conscientious of your creator, and study, and ask him to help you, and put your effort. What? Put your effort. Try and fail versus fail to try. Where where will you be rewarded? Where will you be held accountable? If you try and fail, genuinely, you'll be rewarded. Wow, yeah, yeah, you'll be rewarded. If you fail to try, you'll be held accountable. For what? For betraying the amana. Time, effort, resources, etc., etc., on multiple levels. Betraying the amana is no good. But you tried and you failed? God bless you. Let's try again. Are we on the same page? But if you do it, you got to do it right. Inna Allah yuhibbu idha amila ahadukum amalan an yutqina. Allah loves when someone does something and they do it well. Whether you're a teacher teaching, whether you're a student learning, whether you're working, you do it well. And you know when people do things well? 
they'll do it well when they love Allah. If you love Allah, you'll do things well. If you don't, you won't do things well. What does this have to do with teaching? It has to do all with teaching. If you love Allah, then you love that Allah placed you in a position of teaching. And if you love what you do, you'll be the best at it. If you have no love of Allah that is really driving you, then teaching becomes a frame for you to present your perfections as you perceive them, rather than Allah's mercy as it's supposed to be. You guide to you rather than you guide to Him. Therefore, you will not be good at it. Straightforward. And even if you were information delivery-wise, there will be no beneficial knowledge gleaned from it. Even if there was, there will be no blessings and barakah in it. There's no lastingness in it. So, you want to do something? Do it right. If you can't do it right, don't do it. Or at least say, I can do this, I can't do the rest. That's part of your amana. And the Prophet is telling them here, وَيْلٌ لِلْأَعْقَابِ مِنَ النَّارِ Save your heels from the fire. Well, because you're not doing it right. All right, so I want to uh, put a point here in our understanding and mind that a person of faith, a Muslim, if they do teaching, they ought to strive to be the best teachers. If they are students, they ought to be the best of students. Because you have to apply yourself. Allah is watching you. And Allah wants you to do the best job you can. If you're studying engineering, then you ought to be the best engineer. If you're studying medicine, you ought to be the best physician. If you're a journalist, you ought to be the best. If you're an IT tech, tech worker, if you are Nazmi, you have to do the best in photography and audio. If you are, um, you uh, uh, clean the facility, you ought to do the best, right? There is an example I was told, right? building a masjid. So as a masjid was being built, an inspector came, started asking the big engineers, hey, what's going on? Oh, we're building this thing here, now we're trying, but we're going to perfect this here, this dome here, the, these rooms here in the masjid. You know, uh, we're trying to build this room here and make this room better. The electrician, what are, we, what are you doing? I'm trying to make sure electricity is lit in this area here because the lighting is not uh, to my satisfaction. Uh, I'm, you, know, uh, you ask the, the plumber, he says, I'm trying the water here that's running. I need it to run through here so that the water here runs well. Right? Oh, the people are complaining. This one is not working. This one is not doing. This is not, you know, I'm the one who's doing this. The electric side is not doing their job. They're not, not, right? Everyone is. No, the, the, the electric side, I'm doing it here, but the, uh, you know, the, the construction is not allowing me to do. Came to the janitor, the one who's cleaning, what are you doing? He says, I'm building a house of Allah. As he's sweeping, what are you, what's, what's your job here? He says, my job is to build the house of Allah. So, your job as you're studying here and as you're teaching, as you go to teach, because I expect you, whatever you learn from here, you take it to your family, you take it home. That's amana as well. Amana is that you learn and you don't keep it to yourself. You go 
and you're automatically now teaching it to your close ones in the neighborhood, in the house, obviously, friends, family, reaching out far and beyond. That's the idea. There's no good in a dead tree in that sense. Well, I use it for, uh, to make a fire. All right. So as you're learning and you're taking and all that, you're actually now taking ownership of your deen. You are no longer, when you, uh, I hope that that was clear to you when you joined Medina. And joining Medina now, hopefully should mean to you, that you're no longer a spectator. You no longer watch things happen in the deen. You are now in the circle of make things happen. You don't just watch. You are part of the process. You are part of the prophetic dawa. You are part of the prophetic mission. It's no longer someone else's job who's, who needs to deliver this and ensure the continuity of the prophetic sunnah and the prophetic mission. Welcome to the mission. It's now upon your shoulders to do the best job you can to be a follower of the prophetic mission rather than a spectator the way you used to be. Let me watch things happen. You can't afford now to watch things happen. You're here. You're now on the level of let me make things happen. And you need to make things happen. And in that, the sky is the limit. Right? Or if you like, the sky is the beginning. Whichever you like. All right, with that, I'm going to leave you because we have, she wants me to stop at eight, wants me to stop at uh, one. So I'll let me I'll open the floor for questions. If you all have questions, especially if they're relative to what we've said or to the faith in general. Or if they're not after that. Bismillah. There is, feel free, raise your hand, say your name. It's okay, you can ask questions. I won't hold it against you. She's saying. All right. So um, if you have any question, comment, or concern, uh, go ahead, or especially, like I said, if it's relevant. Raise your hand, tell me your first name. Yeah, who's going to be the brave one that breaks the ice in the first, uh, in the first attempt? Yes, sir. See, I see a brave hand. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Ahlan Muhammad. Nice name. We share the same name, Shaykh. Talk about the difference between Ma'arifah and Arabic. Yes. The definition and how to be focused on Arabic. So. Ma'rifa should be a component of ilm rather than information. So I say data or data, I don't know how, whatever you say. You say tomato or tomato? 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 Potato or potato? Potato? All right, so you're like us in that sense. Okay. All right. So data is information. I call that ma'lumat in the Arabic language. I don't call that, I don't call memorized inform, I don't call information ilm. Ilm and information are not the same. So if that data now becomes a reality, a realization, that's ilm, which is ma'rifa. But ilm is only the beginning of ma'rifa in that sense. So ma'rifa becomes, it's a limitless thing when it has to do with Allah, Rabbul Alameen, right? Because see, what we know about Allah Azza wa Jal is sufficient for us, yet it's, we don't know. What we can know is limitless. So therefore, there's, it's an epistemological question here uh, as well. Like, and let's put it this way, that ilm and ma'rifah share a foundation. 
if you have in, you have ma'rifa. And uh, ma'rifa then extends beyond. Wallahu alam. Yes. Any other question? Hmm. Yes, sir. Very nice. Thank you for that question as well. So, again, part of the amana is that you do things right, we said, correct? You apply yourself correctly. That's amana. If you don't apply yourself correctly, that's not amana. How do you apply yourself correctly when you're making wudu? Do you waste water? No, you don't. What if you're doing wudu from a running in front of you, a running river? Do you still waste water? No. That defies amana. And that's in the prophetic hadith. That you do not waste wudu. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah. You don't waste the water. Even if you're doing wudu in front of you, or there, there's in front of you a running river. Waste is contrary to amana. Any waste. Waste of time. Waste of your youth. Waste of your skills. Waste of your energy. Misapplication of anything is contrary to amana. Amana is basically doing it right. So it fits in that concept. So wasting time, wasting, sorry, time and wasting water is contrary to amana. So train yourself, right? I, I hear my children going to make wudu and I can hear the water in the bathroom gushing. I can see. It's like they're opened it like the max, maximum effect, right? And it bothers me. So I, they'll hear my voice. Lower, lower that thing down, 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 down. Let it just be just a little bit. And learn how to fill your, to fill your hands actually. Just fill your hand properly. And say Bismillah, for example, right? Rather than just the water is just, it's gushing at your hands. That's not the sunnah. Right? I mean, we used to be able to, I think, exercise. We did, obviously. Can we do wudu with this water, this water here? Yeah, I can. This is pretty good. I mean, this is nice. If you fill this with water and do wudu with this, this is pretty good. Right? Can adab be? Akhlaq. Can, can akhlaq invite people to Islam? Akhlaq is how people come to Islam. You know, people don't... People called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam As-Sadiq al amin before his da'wah was announced. So... Love and compassion are key in our Muslim missionary work. They're key in our Muslim life anyway. But love and compassion neutralizes prejudice or neutralize the prejudices that we all have. They need love and compassion to be neutralized. Anytime you see people who have prejudice, don't be upset. Feel sorry. Why? They haven't had love. There's no love. Right? So any illness, any, any like let's say personal diseases of the heart, simply require impoverished heart. There's no love. So our job is to what? To guide to that point. And first of all, try to live it, but not live it to master it, because we won't be able to master it in our lifetime. So it's a simultaneous thing. That's why we cannot be assertive. That's why Allah commanded us to have purification of the heart. Hmm? Right? But he said, 
Do not claim it. He commands you to do it. And he prohibits you from claiming it. You see the balance there. Allah commands you to seek purification of the heart. قَدِ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى قَدِ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Another ayah, right? Successful is the one who seeks the zakiyah. That's a command to do. Then he prohibits you from claiming tazkiyah. He said, لا تزكوا أنفسكم Do not claim tazkiyah. هو أعلم بمن اتقى He knows who's best best. That's the balance. Yes. Any other question? We have one minute less. Alaikum salam. Ahlan ya Allah. Very good question, and you made me remember something that I had forgotten. Thank you, sir. The Bedouin came to ask the Prophet ﷺ about the date and the time, basically, of Qiyamah, right? Does the Prophet ﷺ even answer that question in the way the Bedouin asked? Absolutely not. When is Qiyamah happening? What does the Prophet ﷺ give him? Signs. Why is he giving him a sign? Why couldn't he tell him, uh, it will happen, you know, it's exactly so and so and so, etc., etc. Because the Prophet ﷺ is trying to direct a misdirected question to a good, beneficial Result, meaning. So, if I tell you Qiyama will happen in 231 years, uh, five months, three weeks, and two and a half days, how will that make it a difference? Or I tell you after 1,500 years versus what do I tell you? Like the other hadith, when the, another one also, also a Bedouin, came to the Prophet ﷺ and told him, Ya Rasulullah, when is the Day of Judgment? Mata sa'a, exactly the same wording, kind of. What does the Prophet ﷺ respond to him? Wa what have you prepared for it? So the question, notice the wisdom of the, of the answer. The wisdom of even if the, the question wants something specific to be specific, but the answer can only be something that is beneficial for maybe there is no much benefit in giving you a specific date and time. But the benefit is if amana is lost, which means what? What is the Prophet ﷺ telling him? Go work on amana. Behave in an amana way. Spread amana. Live amana. For so long there is amana, there will be no qiyamah. Once there is no more aman, once there is no more amana, that's when qiyamah will happen. So long there's people still carrying out their amana. There's no qiyamah. What is that doing? That's action rather than information. Notice again, right? We move from information to realization. Information, date so and so, date so and so. That's information. That's not important. What have you prepared for it? Or if the amana is no more there, that's when qiyamah happens. That's now realization. You make sure you uphold amana. 
Otherwise, if you don't uphold amana individually, your qiyamah has already been called. And your qiyamah happens on only the worst. Qiyamah happens on the worst. So, if you individually lose your amana, then your, your qiyamah has been called already. All right? So the answer needs to be what? Something beneficial. Right? People always ask, Sheikh, we need, I mean, in the old days, now they learn not to do that. Even if they do, I just ignore it, yani, in that sense. We need to have a, a whole 10 days, some seven days about eschatology. Alamatu <laughs> sa'a. So I. Please, Sheikh, talk to us about the beast and the Mahdi and the Isa. How will, how will, will he descend? Will he parachute down, or alayhi salam, or will it be like you know a jet coming down? Which white minaret uh, will we? You know, how is he gonna pray, uh, uh, Imam and the Salah? Will he do it the Shafi'i way or the Hanafi way or the Maliki? You know. So everybody says, no, when he comes, he will follow the madhab of Imam Babu Hanifa. Or madhab. And tell us, Mawal Sheikh, tell us about the, uh, all these things. And versus the Prophet Wasallam, as you see in the Quran and in the Sunnah, he puts the signs and he asks you what? It's not about the signs. The signs is so that you take note so it can be trans translated into action. What are you doing about it? What difference does it make to you if the Mahdi comes or doesn't come, or Isa alayhi salatu wasalam comes or doesn't come? If Isa alayhi salam wal Mahdi, they come, let's say, will that alleviate you from the following of the Quran and the Sunnah, or will it, will it still, you still have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah? It's just a sign for you to remember, I need to focus on what I need to be doing rather than waste the amana of time Allah gave me. So therefore, I'm not a fan of, 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 of expansive eschatology in general, especially if it's beyond Quranic and authentic sunnah, to be honest with you. Right? Because I look at the Quran, and you need to look at the Quran as students of knowledge thematically. Thematically, how so? How many times does the Quran speak about the signs of the Day of Judgment versus the Day of Judgment? Is that an emphasis? Yeah. If Allah emphasizes something, He mentions something one time, and He mentions about Yawm Al-Qiyamah and, and how to prepare for it all throughout the book. Guess what the emphasis is? Quranic emphasis. Are we on the same page? So that's one. So what do we do? You do, first of all, you start with yourself and you also do it with others. Self and others. Self and others. I don't believe that we're in a time where we can, like I say, remain spectators. We have to be taking action, positive action towards self and also in a framework. That, that's the whole idea of Medina, to be honest with you. Now, I'm not claiming uh, perfection here in any way for the product or the, obviously the individuals. But the idea is to have a platform through that's open through which you can positively contribute and also shape shape the, the, the direction as you go. But it takes firm leaders to shape directions. Believing in the cause, assertive, and not intimidated. Because the mission is bigger than all of us. So then, you can shape it and move it forward to be more, more prophetic. 
more prophetic or closer to the prophetic standard as you can. Because all things start attempts, even with good intentions, but attempts. And there are lots of imperfections. It takes strong leaders with profound faith in the Quran and the Sunnah. Mentally tough. Mental toughness. They're not intimidated, yet at the same time, extremely humble because they stand under the feet of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Those people will be world changers. Doesn't, you don't need hundreds to change the world. You need a few to change the world. I leave you with that thought and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal for me and you guidance and that Allah Azza wa blesses your journey of knowledge, uh, that Allah Azza wa opens your heart to learning, that He uses you as instruments for good, for His deen, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you all become ambassadors for your faith, and uh, that you learn that your pride is in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, not in your positions that you have taken or opinions that you formulated uh, that you're always willing to change willing to change and that you're always willing to enhance your journey and become better and that the whole object of this institution and you being part of it is that you become better people you already are good people alhamdulillah but that you become better people if that is not happening, there's a problem. So may Allah Azza wa Jal grant us all that, protect you all and your families, and bless you all and your families, and bless Medina and everyone associated with Medina, their family, their children, anyone who puts in anything, even dua, may Allah bless them, bless their children and family. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Oh, yes. Thank you.